Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm here to discuss a number of topics that are found in the book by spiritual author Joanna DeAngelis, Adolescence in Life. If you have not read it before, I appreciate you watching this video, and I welcome you to also read the book. Um, the small book is uh, an invitation to all parents and educators. As a parent, as a Christian spiritist, I find this to be a book containing urgent and unavoidable discussions. So it behooves us to understand all of us, our roles, our responsibilities as parents, educators, citizens of this planet, so we can best understand and engage this new generation. As uh, the prior book, most of them by John DeAngelis contain the range from 20 to 30 chapters. This one is right smack in the middle. It has 25 chapters and uh, it contains quite a wide range of themes, ranging from teenage sexuality, their sense of identity, identity crisis, and it goes all the way to suicide. So our goal today is to leverage this book to confront uh, the challenges parents experience while raising their young. Are you ready? So let's go ahead and get started here. And those are the six, the five chapters, I'm sorry, chapters six to 10 that we're going to just brush through in the next hour or so. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, when we, we talk about possibilities and limits, right? How do adolescents uh, handle those that uh, the time in their lives? And uh, I come to you to say, as I reach my current and yes, old age, I have a sense of right or wrong, how much easier everything seemed to be during my own uh, adolescent years. Physically and emotionally, perhaps I was scared to, to fly, right? But I was ready for it. I felt that I, I had what it took to just take flight. So Jonah DeAngelis reminds us of the, I call it bubbly, right? There's a bubbly enthusiasm when we and our teenagers at the time feel happy. So, of course, with this happiness, this bubbly, uh, it, you know, it, it's sense of eruption that comes with um, happiness and enthusiasm and impulsive. The other side of it is uh, heaviness, pessimism, when things don't go right. And uh, we, as our teenagers, may become depressed. So the, 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 the two sides, the polar sides of this very, very strong type of emotions that elicited during our teenage years, especially. But, you know, if you stop about it and you say, yes, yes, I felt all of those. I felt that my, my life would end when a friend uh, bullied me or another one uh, ghosted me me, so on and so forth. But we pause to think, are those hyperbolic emotions real? Reality, as we mature, is neither the enchanted, blissful world, right, of, uh, of uh, castles and princes and fairy tales. No, but uh, on one hand, they're not that, but they're not um, an experience of having to face an abyss once we have a not so good experience. So I'd like to, to, to pause to just read a few words by Joanna when she talks about uh, this topic. She says, and, and I, I find quite beautiful, life is an ensemble of possibilities waiting to be experienced. Life is an ensemble of possibilities waiting to be experienced so that the spirit 
can grow both morally and intellectually. So she continues, the way people choose to use those opportunities and not the opportunity themselves is what will define their happy or unhappy outcome. Wow, <laughs> a, lot, a lot to unpack here, right? It, it, it makes me really pause and want to reflect upon this. It's not the what. It's not how my life may seem uh, maybe privileged or the opposite of it as a compared to other people. It's not what the possibilities are, but how I live, how I use, how I experience those opportunities that life give to me, that pro life provides to me. So for the teenager who is in that uh, swing, right, from uh, blissful experience to uh, uh, tragedy waiting to happen, right? This, is, this subject is, is, is important for all of us to understand. There are indeed many, many roads to travel. And uh, we, we have to, to look for it while the, the life itself is this array of possibilities, right? It is up to us to choose how to travel. And many of those chosen paths will require us to, to work at it, right? It may require us to uh, get a, a sense of sacrifice or commitment or dedication before we get to the end of the road, before we achieve a certain goal. And we can ask ourselves, let's think about it, how am I choose to use, to leverage, to enhance the opportunities given to me? And I can start very specific to me, to my, to my experience in life, my body. What is it? How is it? How do I honor? How do I treat this body? How, how about my, say, social experiences? How do I show up? How do I treasure and uh, react to those in my social circle? What about my family life? Do I honor my father, my mother, my children, my siblings? my extended biological family, my extended spiritual family, those that have a spiritual connection with me. How do I treat them? What about, um, say, my access to education? Do I take it for granted or do I really cherish it? What about, uh, oh, in my case, right? I, I'm no longer in school, but what about my professional journey? Do, do I treat it as a given to me? I'm entitled or do I, uh, and, and I'm, I'm missing better words, but uh, to me it comes, how do I honor this path taken? What about uh, my spiritual path? How do I behave from a spiritual perspective? Overall, simply put, for the teenagers in our lives or to ourselves as maybe a little bit more mature teenager or you who may be a teenager, listen to, to, to this video. How much am I willing to invest in my own future beyond body, interaction, family life, education, etc., etc.? How am I willing to commit to a future that I can give color to, right? So changing a little bit of subjects here, I, I want us to, to, to bring uh, a sense of uh, a subject that uh, Joanna is famously identified with. So as we know, Joanna DeAngelis is a spiritual author, and uh, we can talk about later on her life, her lives, 
But uh, she was one of the contributors. She was identified, even though she did not identify herself during the publication of the gospel according to Spiritism by Alan Kardec. But she contributed, uh, famously so, to a passage called um, Patience. It is part of the chapter nine and is the item seven. And she goes on to talk about uh, uh, how uh, in, in, in some cases pain is a blessing right and when we suffer through it, it 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 allows us to to grow to to move away right and uh, she calls upon all of us to be patient to be patient with life to be patient with all there is perhaps difficult and uh, she asks us she ends her her entire discussion on patience with giving us a, a call to action or an invitation, if you will, to become patient with courage. Anyway, so, so she, she, she talks about it uh, in, in, in the book, in this chapter specifically, she reminds us again that, uh, yes, we're talking about adolescence and yes, patience is not a forte, right? We are often, very often impulsive, we are just hungry for results. And yet she says, my dear, and I can see her in my mind's eye, Joanna DeAngelo is telling me, my dear, be patient. Life follows its own tight table. It's not upon us to say now versus then. Life has its own timetable. And so... I go back to when I was a teenager, that teenager, just scared to death, but ready to fly. Please note that I could not, metaphorically speaking, fly until my feathers were ready for me to do so. So some of the pearls of wisdom she brings in intertwined with the idea of a patience is patience, number one, right? Patience counters frustrations all of those frustrations when we face when we must wait for something else before we can act upon something she says also that uh, one very important thing for us to 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 believe to understand is that uh, accepting what we cannot control um right? Those are the things that will make us stronger and better. It's just to be resigned to. We cannot control the outcomes of many, many things, right? In accepting that, we'll alleviate the pain when we are facing with some situations. Third, as I drink a little bit of my cup of coffee, um, she says, it's not enough to dream. We need to persevere. We need to actually execute those dreams into a reality. So in, in conclusion for this discussion, right, we may need to learn to patiently wait for the right moment to even begin something. Um, she tells us that uh, all that is expected from us, which is quite beautiful in my opinion, all that is expected from us is just do your best. And I have to say, I go back to, to presenting myself as an old, old person as I speak about adolescence. And I think I've lived enough years to, to be able to, to say so, right? Um, knowing that you've done your best will be the one thing that will set you free for many times when you feel guilty. Oh, I could have. No, you've done your best. 
She also means in terms of uh, patience, right? Uh, so three things that we have to, to patient wait for the right moment. We have to understand that the best that we can do, the, the most that is expected from us is to do all that we can do. But the third and final item is the fact that we should not take on more than we can handle. And yes, I know it's easier said than done. I'm one of those people that uh, uh, often sees myself like, oh, did I, you know, did I do more? Did I select to do more than I can actually um, handle at this point? So she she gives that uh, sense of um, that invitation, that call to action to all of us, but most important, all of us who are living an adolescent experience. So she says, think about your body. It's just an example. Your body has a limit. And as such, we should not push ourselves to do what we are not able to do yet. And um, just a few things that comes to my mind when, when I read that is um, just pushing the boundaries of our bodies by not sleeping enough right? Or in some cases, I will uh, not eat enough or, oh, the other side of it, I will party too much or I, I will be offered and, and will allow myself to experiment too much, right? And, and this is important for us to, to know because on one hand, we know our life is to be lived, yes, 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 our lives is to be lived, but uh, we are here living this life, this uh, material life, to learn, to learn those very valuable lessons that life will offer to us. Why am I saying that? Well, it's because we really learn most from our trial and error, right? Uh, we, we may read in a book and say, hey, do this and uh, we'll do it, but we don't inherently learn. Or what I mean by that, is we don't learn for life, but by actually trying and making mistakes and trying again, we, boy, we really, really learn. And so with that uh, prescription to live life and learn and hence uh, uh, fail, right, we must be prepared, and we often are not, to try to fail when trying and to accept that, that we are not perfect, but we are perfectable that's probably my word created just now, spirits, right? We, we are spirits in an evolutionary path that by falling, quote unquote, falling and making mistakes, but trying, getting up and trying again, we become close and closer to that uh, uh, perfect or pure spirit. So um, we must take risks, Right? We must try. And by taking risks to fulfill a dream, an aspiration of sort, we will be able to get closer to its uh, fulfillment, to its execution. And, and the thought that comes to my mind is, is really that young toddler who, um, without any, any preparation, really, it's just that impulse to grow, does not stop trying to walk after he or she falls. And I say, yes, this, this is a message for me and for you. Let's not be afraid. And some people even say, let's fail and fail fast, right? It, it is with that that I say life's possibilities are endless and our only limitations are our own lack of readiness so let's plan let's follow through and let's achieve our great um, our own greatness right so as we move to the the next um, uh, area of discussion love it because it's about love and passion and uh, yes yeah, so we're shifting a little bit um uh, 
the discussion here because love and and and, and passions all about uh, hormonal exuberance yes i said it love and passion is is really a reflection of all that goes and the, the, i i i see in myself a, a a soup of sorts of uh, all sorts of hormones and uh, let's think about it we have so much going on at this time we we have our very emotional the swing right uh, everything is is uh, is the, the 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 highest level of response we have a very impulsive nature we are ready to do before we are ready to go and yes all the hormones kicking in and, and moving us to be both uh, on the other hand, um, we, we, we lack, and I'm thinking in terms of life, life, uh, material life, but let's zoom in into adolescence here. Um, we don't have enough discipline, and, and, and it's really a reflection of not knowing how much it takes to do what we want to do when we have never done it. Makes sense, right? It doesn't make sense in, in, in words, but we just don't have the experience to say, I need to do this this way and this many times to get to this results. We don't have uh, that knowledge. We don't have the discipline either. And, and finally, um, we really lack, we have an absence of that, uh, what I call the mental order, emotional order, that organizational uh, uh, structure to, to give us a sense of this is how it should be. And, um, and oftentimes, I, I, I think when I say this, is that it's like a, an emotional whirlwind making it really, really hard for us to distinguish between pleasure, fulfillment, sexual ecstasy, yes, I said it, and peace and joy and harmony. Right, it's just a lot of things going on, and it's hard for us to to just stop and say, "Yes, this is peace. This is joy. This is pleasure. This is fulfillment, and um, just the sexual ecstasy that is part of this experience as teenagers." So, think about it. This is the time in our lives when we may indeed experience devastating or irresponsible passions. If I am true here, uh, very honest here, I say I myself escaped from what could have been catastrophic situations. And those situations could have left deep psychological scars in me to the rest of my life. I didn't. So we say, why is that? Why, why are we so vulnerable? And it is because everything is happening, right? Inside us, our bodies, physically, psychological, emotionally. And, and we're in this state of wanting to, to, to just really motivated by new desires, new interest, uh, curiosity. And one uh, small word, right, that uh, frames this time quite well, which is libido. Uh, our libido awakened at this time of our life is very, very powerful. And that may overtake all of our relationships at home, with friends, with everything. So let's think about it, uh, and forgive me for not using perhaps the, the best words for, for today, uh, 2022, but when a new crush comes to our lives and that, uh, that person that we just are, oh, devastatingly in love with may not um, respond, may not react, how could it be? How devastating it is for us when we don't actually have that person be, fall, express 
all that we are feeling back to us. So interesting enough, um, Joanna tells us, well, think about it. Yes, it's, a, it's, it's part of every teenager life, uh, uh, being a victim of our own libido and uh, developing, oh, immense crushes. And there's some things that we could do with it, shall we? And as usually, it's, it comes in, in, in three. So number one, in creativity right? That creative energy is actually a very sexual energy, if you will. And we can use that creative, that uh, artistic uh, energy to create. And we can also use, which is quite a raw energy for, for researching, for studying, for working, whatever it is that, that you want to do. It stems from the same and it mostly from our creativity. And what am I talking about? Oh, music, dancing, um, singing, um, poetry, you name it. It's all very much a, a very creative energy that we can utilize when we cannot control the, our libido. The other one that she says is just leverage all that, uh, those hormones that are really coming to our bodies and sometimes uh, playing havoc to us with too much, right? There are physical, there are psychological aspects uh, to uh, the hormones coming to our body. So use it and abuse it where sports, activities, exerting ourselves, go to, I don't know, walks in nature, and immerse yourself in, in all that is active, physically active. And finally, she says, one other thing is uh, activism, which is something that uh, I find quite enchanting myself. Be an activist in your, in your society, in your community, whatever that may be. You could say, I'm an activist for peace, for climate change, for um, uh, animal uh, against animal cruelty for a cleaner planet. I don't know, but engage. And that in itself will use all that you have and will in turn transform the planet. But back to the libido. Libido is indeed um, an added complexity to the life of a teenager. But the good news is it is a normal part of life. What we must think about it, it, it is part of who we are, but we, we have to think the context in which we live. We should be alert to the fact that we live in a highly, highly uh, interconnected digital age that is, um, statistics uh, prove to us, that is pushing us teenagers to a very premature emergence of our libido, right? Why is that? Well, visual stimulation, audio stimulation, everything is plain because, as I mentioned before, it is such a, a, a powerful uh, uh, impulse to act that uh, advertisers, for example, found that the best way to sell is to to awaken, to stimulate the libido that, that exists in all of us. So due to those uh, uh, very strong stimulations or, say, conversations at all about sex, uh, it, it just focus on, on sex, um, our own curiosity, our own impulsive behavior, and that overstimulation by all, including social media, may lead us to a, a in a sense, a set of false needs. And I'm speaking here, sexually speaking, right? Um, speaking about our sexual needs that we may just want to be alert. Is this my 
overstimulated brain or is it me and my own needs? And, and I say that, uh, I, I hear is a little bit of a joke, so my apologies if I offend anyone, but, uh, you know, you're watching TV and you just had dinner and there comes this amazing, beautifully crafted advertisement for, I will say, pizza. And I'm like, oh, I got to go eat pizza. Very similar. It's just a stimulation to, to lead to something that you may not really need. But, but anyways, let's, uh, let's talk about love, right? Let's talk about, uh, because we talked a lot about passion, but let's talk a little bit about love and, and, and consider what love is in this age group. And uh, it's very interesting because when we love as a teenager, we somehow translate the emotion, the feeling of loving, erotic love, the other, as something that equals to possessive, right? A, a possession, ownership. So that possessive feeling, uh, I think, is important for us to, to, to be aware because you may feel like you own the other, but the other side of the cone is if the other, quote-unquote, owns you, right? If you're owned by your new loved one, be aware that uh, you may be led to be submitted to his or her will that may not meet your own. So it's self-awareness is important. When we think about, uh, uh, and, and I'm going to call immature because we're very young in age and uh, we somehow translate in our archive of uh, emotions, love with possession. So what to do? What to do with that, right? If it happens to so many, just be aware. Be aware that this may happen and that you, you really are not required to submit to something that does not feel right. It also means that all of us need to be aware we should not, as much as we'd like to, impose, that's again the flip side of this, impose our personality to the other. What we want the other to do may not be the best for that other people, even though you love that person, right? And uh, as difficult if, as all of this means, real love, I smile here, big, because, you know, when we think about love, love is the, the fulfillment of our humanity, our divinity in, in our lives. But real love is really an expression of strength, of character, and yes, maturity. Maturity because real love will demonstrate responsible choices, right? Uh, an example of that is being tender. Tenderness never imposes I'm going to be tender with you, but you must do that. No, it doesn't work like that. So it's important to, to understand that if real love is rare to, to be found in our adolescent years, they're not impossible, right? And uh, some of us um, do fall in love in that real love, and they are indeed capable of loving deeply, who are those? Well, uh, you know, experienced spirits incarnating again, and uh, and they usually demonstrate the evidence. Uh, they show evidence of their maturity by a strong sense of understanding, a strong sense of empathy and feeling for the other. So the flip side of immature real love, and I'm going to make you upset here, but it's just an example, and it's a fictional example at that, right? An example of that immature love is, well, Romeo and Juliet. Think about uh, it. It is fictional. Uh, it's a fictional account of love, but it ends in tragedy. Why? Well, immaturity, impulsive behaviors, and finally, suicide, right? So as we read that story, if you have not read or watched the movies, plural, uh, it's, it's important to see because it's quite rich from a storytelling perspective. 
And uh, with that, we say love should not destroy. Love vitalizes one, right? And beyond sexual love, we have to say love is love. There are, of course, many different types of love, such as, I don't know, maternal love, Filial love, the, the love of a child to his or her parents, fraternal love. And by fraternal, I don't always mean your siblings, but uh, loving all those who are around you, right? Um, love your, your extended family, uh, spiritual family, all of those who, who accompany you in this journey. So uh, let's think about it. I talk, started with sexual love, went to other types of love. I'm going to go back to sexual love. Sexual love in, usually involves passion, right? And passion is ignited by all those hormones in your libido. And passion, only passion without love, it... Um, feel like maybe a, a self-consuming fire, right? And, and, and that fire goes bright and it burns itself. Real love, on the other hand, is ignited and it's long-lasting. It, it doesn't consume you or consume itself. So teenagers out there, be prepared for the many passions that will, quote unquote, explode. Many, one, two, three, a hundred, I don't know, right? They will explode in your adolescence. It's okay. But be aware that love will come just a few times. So it is sad, sad for me to say that many relationship many unions will most likely fail once the conditions that made it possible are no longer there right if i quote unquote fall in love uh and passionately so because you're wealthy beautiful or whatever once those conditions are not there eh, it, it fizzles out so be prepared to be open to the guidance of uh, others. And I, I, yeah, I'm going to say, be open to your parents or to those who play uh, an educational role in your life because uh, they're there to help you and because um, as you're equally open to experimentation this time, you should be considered be open to the guidance of others. So I wish you all a loving life fulfilled with many, many tender friends. But let's keep moving. We have a few more minutes to, to talk today. And I'm going to talk to you about dating. Yes, dating. Because falling in love is one thing. But dating is a whole different ball of wax, right? And, and, and the funny thing is we don't have a class on dating, do we? I, 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 I try to remember a series. It's a Netflix uh, docudrama about um, uh, neuroatypical uh, individuals of all ages and how if dating is hard for typical, neurotypical, it is infinitely harder for if you are atypical. And I'm talking about those in the autistic spectrum. So they, they the, the series about people coming and um, filming, right, documenting the their dating uh, process, but also teaching them, giving lessons, uh, cues. If somebody says that, you say something else. When you sit at the table, so it's really cute. But anyways, we don't. I never did. No one ever told me that. For you to date, Marcia, those are the rules. One, two, three, four, five. But uh, anyways, we don't. And uh, we have to think, but we all, we all, we don't, we don't, we're not prepared. We don't get lessons, but we do date. Why? Because sexual attraction is so, so powerful during our adolescence that we are just pushed. No matter how introverted or extroverted you are, we are pushed 
to express our need for affection or exchange in affection. And the funny thing is that it feels like in the blink of an eye, right? In the blink of an eye, a minute ago, I was a young child and I had all my, my buddies, my friends, and uh, my family, my father was my hero, so on and so forth. And boom, we just look up and come back and everything, all my interest, all my my relationships, everything disappear and is replaced by this uh, different type of motivations, including a deep need for those interpersonal relationships. I believe uh, you you may agree with the, with me. But think about it. It's when we look at each other uh, at that time and... Um, and I'm thinking of, you know, Romeo and Juliet, perhaps. You're young and you look at each other and you knew that person. And like all of a sudden, you start to see those uh, logical transformations in the other. Uh, yeah. And we also see in ourselves. So there's restlessness, there's embarrassment sometimes, uh, and yet we are urged. There's the thing that urges us to experiment, and so dating begins. What could go wrong? Oh, a bunch of things, but let's let's pick up a couple uh, of things. Uh, um, sex, when there's no commitment to be emotionally engaged. That's one thing that could go wrong. Ah, with that, seeing the other as a, an object, right? So sex, intercourse, you have it. And once it's done, you discard that person. That, that person is no longer relevant. And with that, a promiscuity. You just go into a string of uh, uncommitted uh, types of uh, uh, sexual encounters to during your dating time, right? That's, that, I believe, that what could go wrong. That's one alternative. But the other, which, which I could call it maybe what could go right, is perhaps discovering in the other during dating, deeply rooted interest in the other, right? That you are fascinating, that you want to get closer, that uh, you want to be emotionally engaged, that you want to, to, to perhaps uh, listen and engage in rich, rich conversation, rich in the content of uh, emotionally rich, but also intellectual rich for you. Um, you may find an outlet for affection, for caring the other, for tenderness. Oh, and one that you should never forget, which is just a, 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 an opportunity to encounter what is different, right? Uh, and as such, an exercise in diversity of interest or uh, psychological behaviors, cultural expression, so on and so forth. So when we understand that attraction is nothing more than a sexual stimulus, yes, nothing more, right? No further meaning beyond a chemical uh, interaction there uh, or stimulation. We see that beyond that initial attraction, if there's nothing done with it, if there is no interest in the other, there's really nothing to gain beyond the sexual activity itself, the sexual release, right? So think about it. you're dating somebody and uh, dating moves toward a sexual relationship without that uh, necessary psychological maturity or even emotional um, bonds that, that, that ties the, the two people. Um, it leads probably to frustration, right? It may lead to perhaps inappropriate practices that can actually uh, result in sexual pathologies, if you think about it, as it goes to extreme. Let's not forget now, sex is 
a beautiful, divine aspect of our lives. Yes, it is. Uh, so dating is a type of uh, preparation for teenagers to learn about themselves. Because in that rich interaction, as you access the other, you also access in yourself, right? As, as the other becomes vulnerable, you too become more vulnerable. And it opens up the, the, the richness of who you are as a person. And so think uh, perhaps that these new types of relationships, uh, affection is also, it's just life, is also coupled with uh, perhaps uh, conflicts, right? Uh, and and I, I can think in my mind's eye, if you ever study drama, Right, every every drama, romantic drama, it starts with everything's rosy and beautiful, and there's this crescendo until boom, there is a conflict, and once the conflict is resolved, there is a quote unquote happy ending, and that is just that. Um, we we need to be vulnerable, but we need to be aware that the most likely there will be difficulties. You're not one person, and even if you're one person, a relationship with yourself, it's full of conflicts. Can you imagine to 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 have with somebody else that's going through the same things that you're going through? And um, if if that relationship is uh, is a, a, a very healthy one that allows for uh, its resolution, a healthy resolution, I put, um, it's, it's all good. It, it's enriching. It's actually uh, pushing the boundaries of the relationship itself. But if not, right, then it's uh, an environment that can fester. And by that, I mean is um, creation of a, a space, a room for lies, for uh, pretends, for unrealistic expectations of the other. And, and those unrealistic expectations may even be regarding your own appearance and all sorts of um, forged Right, and by forge I mean pretense behaviors. So I, I close my discussion here about uh, about uh, dating, saying that dating feels a need, right, in all of our lives that should lead to psychological renovation, to comfort, but it should be carried with care. I I hope it makes sense to you. So let's uh, just keep moving on, and we're here on the uh, ninth chapter of the book, where we talk a little bit about expectations, yes, and what type of expectations am I talking about? Well, what I expect as a teenager from society, and what society may expect from me, and I I, I just think about it as, as this this book is pushing me to think a lot about me as a teenager. But in this case, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, when my kids were teenagers themselves, and it was funny because you 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 have you become a mother and you have these young uh, beings in this case, and they become to be somebody that you that you learn to 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 care and to say Steve be late and in discipline etc and poof with the blink of an eye again they become what it feels like a completely different people and nobody came to introduce us right they were like the rest of us um going through this phase of experimentation with their own physiological psychological bodies in a ways they have never done before. And that's that's what it is. We become not the monster, as I mentioned last week, uh, the girl that became a, be, would become a monster in that cartoon uh, every time something triggered, but they become somebody they're not used to it. It's, it's a response mechanism or different. Uh, things that used to be okay become a source of ir irritability, so on and so forth. So, 
in addition to all of it, um, as teenagers, there's this crisis of identity of sorts, right? And it happens directly related to all of those hormones raging inside of us. And uh, I'm just going to talk about two types of hormones, the, the one from the hypophysis or the pituitary glands. They secrete hormones that will... Uh, actually lead to profound alterations in your physical organizations. And we're talking about testosterone, estrogen, et cetera, et cetera, right? On the other hand, we also have growth hormones secreted by thyroid, for example, during this time that will lead to, to things like uh, gain, a uh, very rapid gain in, in growth, in height, etc., but also in weight. So with that, we have to think that uh, all of it is happening at the same time where physical, sexual, psychological, and cognitive changes at the same time. And as such, all of a sudden, you are somebody else and without preparation by any means, and you feel like society is not there to understand you or help assist you while you're going through those changes. And by society, I mean your, your, your family structure, I mean your school, your friends, uh, your, uh, your church, if you go to church, nothing of the framework that you had before react to, with, to you mostly. I'm talking about in general terms here, of course. They don't come to you in assistance to the conflicts that you're going through yourself. Um, cognitively speaking, as, as I said, uh, psychologically, emotionally, all of the turmoil and changes that are happening at the same time, and there's no one out there that really is prepared to, uh, to understand you. But that's your expectation. It should be, actually. I did not choose to do this. It's just happening to my body, to my mind, to my emotions. Be there to understand me. So um, being not prepared or inadequately prepared for all that is, 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 is going through is the reason for many difficult uh, results, harmful or in some case actually fatal. Think Romeo and Juliet, right? And uh, the, the other component of that is, um, as we can say, is the fact that uh, advances in technology, and I alluded to that before, but advances in technology and our access to information, our access to knowledge is, is so great now that uh, it is leading to a premature um, a sense of stimulation in this age group, especially girls. So beyond the expectations of society uh, from one end to the other, that society should understand the conflicts that each person, each teenager out there is going through, uh, there's something else, which is the disruptive forces in place resulting from the clash between generations. And we talk here about the clash between me and my my parents, for example, their, their, their way of uh, thinking, behaving, conducting, selecting things. And the clash is there. And I love it that it's there. As, as an adult now, no longer a teenager, I love that it's there because without it, what we would have? Status quo. The clash is actually disruptive in nature, but leads to progress. So historically speaking, it's when we see renewal, right? We also see, unfortunately, aggression and even violence and I'm I'm afraid to say when things happen special to girls my mind specific goes to certain areas of the globe where girls or women are disadvantaged in many ways including edu access to education right so um think about it um clash 
there is a misunderstanding you you want to you want to be respected and you're not you want to be uh, understood and you're not and you don't understand or respect either there is that disruptive nature and at some point yes uh, adolescence is 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 a finite uh, time it should be finite at some point um we come to terms with our own hormones in getting achieved in a sense of uh, balance and we're no longer so crazy and uh, we we're there and uh, we start to look at society and we look at life and we look at our parents we look at our social institutions our churches our schools our friends with different eyes we start to reevaluate all of the events in the spirit of time and we somehow become able to reprogram who we are to a no a new norm right and that's the the new norm becomes your new cultural environment your your uh, ecosystem if you will all changed post teenage years why well because there are many other teenagers there so that's why we talk about generational clashes it's not just you so maturity and reason come to a different um, sense or understanding or perspective what society is and society in turn um, have a, a, a wrong, misguided uh, expectation that uh, now that you're no longer a teenager, adult, conform. And that's not the case. The former teens are now the agents of change to a new society. Ha! Huh, isn't it amazing? So generational conflicts that are unavoidable bring a space, a shed light to new ideas, new needs, um, the establishment of new channels of uh, communication, channels for understanding, channels of platforms for cooperation, and all of these leading to a new integration a new construction of a new reality and you my dear you're responsible for that i love it so let's go ahead and finish our time together today with a discussion of violence and it's really uh the the, the slide here is is very harsh but uh, we just wanted to to talk about uh, uh, the expectations or the stereotypes of uh, adolescence right and uh, as we we close our discussion we we just have to say that adolescence regardless is a very difficult stage of our human development and there are many, many, many challenges, many, many hurdles to you, teenager, as well as to you, caretaker, to you, a parent and educator or anyone who's taking care of a teenager. And so as I, as I, as I close, I wanted to say it's really cute because uh, uh, Aristotle and if you don't know Aristotle, he is a Greek philosopher that lived, oh, about 300 years before Jesus Christ. So uh, 2,300 20, years ago, he said, Mr. Aristotle, adolescents are impetuous, short-tempered, and irritable. Did he say anything that is not true? No, Aristotle, you're right on. Uh, Plato before Aristotle, and it's just funny, he said, he advised to all, do you, adolescent, you, teenager, do not drink alcoholic beverage before the age of 18. And in, I'm from, uh, I was born in Brazil, but I live most of my life in the U.S. So speaking to you from the U.S., and I know um, 21 is the age for you to, to, to be able to buy and consume alcoholic beverage. Plato said, do not do this before you're 18, 
because you do, do not want to put fire onto fire. I love it. Well, about uh, 1700s, uh, 17th century, actually, se uh, maybe 2,000 years after Aristotle, right? Uh, there's an account of a priest. And uh, this is my final, but uh, funny enough, example of how people classified those difficult years of an adolescent. So this, this priest said that youth was much like a new ship that is christened and sent into the ocean waters without either a rudder or a pilot to steer it. So you can tell it can go anywhere. So with those concepts that are very, very cool to think about, especially because of the age that they, uh, uh, how long ago they were said, but they, they really um, may bring a sense of, violence if you think of them as censorship, right? Or intolerance or unacceptance. So Joanna brings to us the, the notion, right? That um, if, if we as adolescents are going through physical changes, those changes um, are an echo of our psychological changes and uh, that result uh, from a crisis of identity or results into a crisis of identity. And she reminds us as we're closing that this transitional period is, is really all about finding yourself, right? You go through, I don't know who I am, but just because you don't know who you are, you seek to find who you are, your own identity. And, and she says, it's, it's all about also uncovering your role in this lifetime. If we don't, and this is really important, if we don't, if we avoid, if we try to, to use escape mechanism not to deal with our own crisis ident of identity, you will miss a very, very, very important step in your growth. So uh, as you are finding and seeking to deal with that uh, uh, crisis of identity, you understand and uncover your role in this lifetime, and it reflects really on how you conduct yourself, how you choose to be who you are. And uh, she puts on another and final wrinkle to this discussion, which is the perspective of an immortal soul. And as that, very interesting. This period is super, super important because um, reincarnation is for the spirit an opportunity for atonement yes atonement as well it is an opportunity for training us immortal spirits for our greater achievement and challenge that we have so think about it if i am an immortal spirit and i'm going through this crisis of an identity and i'm i'm seeking who i am i'm also getting open to awakened spirit and with that awakened spirits are also old wounds old vices old qualities all of it's coming up to to bring to you who you who you truly are and and and, and she said that those uh that we start to see in yourself are really our tendencies right? My tendency to be an addict is something that I bring with me. My tendency to be a patient person also uh, demonstrates something that I brought with me. So uh, let's think about it. If we are here to grow, but also to atone our past lives, this is the time for us to seek perhaps restraint, perhaps guidance as I choose my path beyond uh, current uh, period because this this period 
as we said many, many times today, is a, a period of many, many simultaneous physiological developments. And uh, it's, it's because of it, uh, this moment of I'm okay, I'm not okay with myself. So it is a strange process. And um, it pushes us to rediscover who you are, your own identity. And it's a period that allows you for readjustments of not only who you are, who you've been, but also who you want to be. So as we reach the final moment, a final minute of our time together, just think about it. As we reach a sense of harmony between the, the phys physical psychological areas, right? We also grow free from all, and this is really important, all of our inner violence that is inside of us, that we bring with us. And uh, we are ready to face what lies beyond us. So I close today with a deep sense of gratitude for your time and I will see you next week. Thank you so much and so long.